once again, this is Nuance. Thank you all for joining us. As always, I am Mike Scala, joined by Jay Carter, also known as Timmy, the hip-hop artist and the chair of BLM Tokyo. What's going on, Jay? Not a lot, actually. It's a quiet morning. Um, going to be another run day, though, so uh, that's going to change in a little bit. Yes, I need to get into the gym and start working out on the regular because I do have a wedding I'm going to in August in Mexico, actually. And I keep telling myself we get in shape for that wedding. So always good to have that motivation. Yeah, but you got to do it. The clock is ticking. I know. I know. In fact, maybe when we finish up here tonight, I'll walk over to the gym. How about that? Sounds like a good plan right there. Sounds like a good plan, but you got to remember, you got to, if you're trying to, trying to get in shape or, or slim down or, or whatnot, you got to uh, make sure you do a calorie deficit so that, uh, you know, more is going out than it's going in. Right. That certainly helps. Though it's funny, last time I had a personal trainer, she asked me to prepare a list of what I eat in a typical day to get a sense of how many calories I'm consuming. And... Um, you know, it varied. I, my diet wasn't always the same, but I just estimated what I would usually eat. And she looked at it and she was like, oh, this is perfectly normal. Like you just you should keep eating this, basically. Um, mm-hmm. I think probably I would need to be mindful of snacks more than anything. <laughs> to try not to have as many snacks, but I don't really eat anything too crazy. You know, Are you a, but you're not really a snack person, that, if I recall. I get hungry, though, depending on the thing is, this: I don't always have three meals. I I usually don't have a a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner. And so sometimes my eating schedule is a little irregular and then I'll get hungry at a certain time. Like maybe it's late later and I wasn't planning on having another meal, but I'm hungry again. So then I start picking on things. Yeah, no, I know how that goes. That's definitely I, I get like that as well. So, yeah, I know how that goes. Yeah, but definitely when I'm in the gym on the regular, I do trim down because I don't just do the weight training. I do cardio as well. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to get, get rid of all this stuff. Like I said, I gained 20 pounds when I was in Virginia and mm. it's not in the right places. So <laughs> <laughs> is it ever? <laughs> so I got to get rid of that. I guess it is. If you're bulking up with muscle, then, then it could be the right place, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and 20 pounds uh, of fat and versus 20 pounds of muscle look very different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they say muscle heavier than fat per, I mean, obviously 20 pounds of muscle is 20 pounds of fat, but in terms of per capita or however they would describe that. Yeah. um, Per area. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's the correct term, but yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So, So, yeah, no, I it's think, good. I think, I think twenty pounds of muscle of. is twenty pounds of muscle is less bulky than twenty pounds of fat. So it's, I think maybe it's more, it's slimmer or something. I don't know. Right, right. So twenty pounds of muscle versus twenty pounds of fat. I mean, that reminds me of that whole thing about feathers. What was the thing like? What weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of bricks? I mean, they're both a ton, so they're. In theory, they would weigh the same. But then you have smart asses who are like, well, actually, because of the gravitational friction, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But they could take up, they could take up. Uh, it's density. It's, it's really, it's, it's, that's, that's what it's about, density, right? It's about how much space it takes up, how much it weighs in the same space. That's right. Space. I think, yeah. I think fat would take up more space than, than the muscle. I thought it was the opposite. Really? I th- I thought that I could be remembering this wrong. I always thought they said that muscle weighed more than fat per area. Um, I don't know. Well, let's let's go to the AI. <laughs> let's go to the Googles. Let's let's go to them. Um, oh well, can't do that by volume. That's the word we were looking up, thinking of. Yes, it's muscle volume. does weigh more than fat by volume. The muscle okay. weigh more if you take a bowl of fat ew, and compare it to a same size bowl of muscle. Okay. So I had it opposite then. Yeah. yeah. So the 20 pounds of 20 pounds of each is 20 pounds of each. They just would look different. Right. Uh, yeah. Listen, I'll take the 20 pounds of muscle over the 20 pounds of fat any day of the week. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So. Yeah. And I do remember last time I was on that strict weight training regimen 
I was losing weight, but I was also bulking up in the muscle. So, right. Um, yeah, a few things to talk about. I've been in a mixing craze and I've been driving myself crazy with it as I sometimes do, where then you start to analyze everything. In fact, I was even listening to nuance episodes and I was like, oh man, somebody sounds a little bit too loud. So, but like, you just start to like get overly sensitive to sound when you're in that mixing phase where you try to get your music to sound just right. But the problem is, as people who have done this know, you're trying to get it sounding good across all different types of speakers. And so, you can make it sound great in the headphones or whatever you're listening to at that moment. Then you play it in something else. And it's like, oh, this is terrible. And it's like, and then you adjust it for that, but then it sounds bad in the original thing. It's like trying to find that balance. You can drive yourself crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then the longer you do it, the, you know, you get what people like to call um, ear fatigue. Absolutely. It just, no, but that's the thing. That's the thing though, because I'll be listening to something for hours and not know if it's good or not at a certain point, it's just like, I, I don't even know anymore. And then you do something that you think is good. And then you go to sleep or whatever, you go back to it the next day. And you're like, what was I thinking last night? This is way off. Like you, your ears just weren't. Your ears were tired. They were yeah, just... they were tired. And, and you were tired too. Not just your ears, your whole body gets yeah. tired of doing this for hours. And it's like, you can't even think straight anymore. You know? <laughs> yeah. So no, I, I... No, that goes from like I'm not a I'm not the biggest fan of mixing. It's not you know it it takes you know it's it's a particular set of skills and it takes a certain type of uh, patience for one. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of patience involved. It's you know it's a lot of effort. It's people patience do, and a little bit of insanity. I think a little bit. And people who do mixing, um, you know, deserve their credit. Who who can uh, sit down and do that and take something and turn it into something that's that's super dope. So yeah. But that's why I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I, I love it and I hate it. I have like a love-hate relationship with it, right? But I love to be able to get to that finish line and say, listen, I took this raw audio and I converted it into something. I think of it almost like dressing my songs up for the outside world, right? Like I'm getting them ready to be presentable <laughs> off of my computer, off of my, my studio space. And, you know, so I'm trying to get them to sound like they could go with other songs that are out there on the radio and other albums right, on, right. on Spotify, wherever, right? On TikTok. Oh, you're going to be a cute little song. They're going to love you. Here, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, and it's like your baby, right? Like you're getting your right, baby right, ready right. in the world. Now, you know what? I was going to, okay. I forgot to mention earlier that, um, when well, we were talking basically the pregame, um, I came across, I was scrolling through TikTok and apparently you know, Timbaland is on, now that we're talking about mixing and stuff, Timbaland is on TikTok. You know, he's got probably about uh, 900,000 followers on TikTok and he goes live and he has this show called, uh, I don't know, Timbo I IDO or something like that. Mm. And he he reviews he listens to and reviews people's songs live on his uh tiktok stream oh, wow. his tiktok show um and so you would send the music in ahead of time and then it goes into this pool and then he randomly will pull out and he not only listens to the song but he pulls the person up on on live with him and so they get two songs that he'll listen to and he'll wow. he'll comment and be like okay well this is this is dope or this is trash um, you know, you need to rework this or, or whatever. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Like Timbaland is, you know, major, major producer. And um, to do this, he charges $5 a pop. So mm. you charge, you pay $5, you send in your um, TikTok handle and your two tracks, you mail it to him. He doesn't guarantee that he's going to listen to them. He will I was going to ask that. So it's not refundable. You pay that whether he listens to it or not. Right. And so what happens is you, um, he guarantees to listen to it if it's picked for live and everyone's picked at random. So he, he gets this big pool okay. and then they pick however many they do for their, their live show. And then he pulls the person up onto the stream. So does he say that this is a good opportunity? That's what you would always hear when they try to get you to pay to play. It's a good opportunity, though. I don't. I don't think he says that. I just says. I think it's more like, look, if you want to do this, this is how it's done. The dice. Listen, I respect the hustle, and this this will actually lead into this thing I want to talk about. This who's who in America letter I got 
similar type deal, I think. But um, no, l- listen, I respect the hustle if people are upfront about what it is, right? Right. As long as they're not trying to dupe you, because you would see that at these showcases and they would always yeah. read it the wrong way where they try to present it as something it wasn't. If they were yeah. honest and they're like, hey, listen, we're charging you to get on. Take it or leave it. You know, all right, cool. It's your choice. Do it if you want. Don't do it if you don't want. But they try right. to act like oh, this is a great opportunity for you. We're going to have A&Rs in a building. You might get signed. You might walk out a millionaire. Like, no, nah, right. like, you know, don't don't try to do people. You don't try to hustle people. Yeah. Just it's and- straight up about what it is. And I don't think he's trying to do that. Like, I, I didn't get the yeah. sense because I watched it for a little bit and I didn't get the sense that it was like he was trying to hustle people to pay. Like, oh, yeah, just go ahead and pay, pay. Let's just do this. This could be a good look for you. As long as the word opportunity was not used. That's my yeah. litmus test. Don't use yeah, the word it was more like It was just more like, oh, this is this. Is, if you want to get your potentially get your music up here, if you want, you know, then hit the hit the, the link. It's a processing fee. It's today's version of shipping and handling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I was, you know, on one hand, sure, that would be pretty dope. Like, if you get picked and, and you got you paid five bucks for a producer at Timbaland's level to, to listen to your music in front of the thousands of people that are in the live, that's really cool. And I saw several times where he um, he actually followed the person. And he's like, oh, you got something there. It's almost there. He's like, you need to get with a certain with, with a producer or a writer. He's like, look, I just followed you. Hit me in the DMs. I'll, I'll try to link you with somebody okay. in your area. So he, he said you, need, you need like a writer or a producer? Some people. He's like, yeah. oh, maybe you need a better writer in, for this song. Or <laughs> maybe you need to rework your lyrics. Or your producer, the beats okay. are a little bit dated. You need something different. And like he gives a little, gives some constructive criticism. If it's trash, he'll just be like, no, no, no. <laughs> he said that. No, no, no. No, you know, he's got a sound clip. It says, no, no, oh. no. And he goes like this in the camera. <laughs> so he'll play on you if it's trash for yeah. him. But I did see one where it was, he was like, no, that's trash. That doesn't work. But the comments were like, that's fire. And he's like, well, mm-hmm. the comments like it. So maybe I might, <laughs> you know. But um, so I saw something with Timbaland in it. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube also where Kanye was mixing Stronger. You ever see this? Um. Yes, yes. One of the engineers was talking about how Kanye was never satisfied with the mix. And I think he got 10 different people to try to mix the song and it just wasn't coming out right. And he ended up taking it to Timbaland. And the whole idea was, you know, all right, maybe it sounds good when I listen to certain speakers, but I was at the club and it played in the club and it just wasn't hitting the way the drums weren't hitting the 808s, whatever it is, you know, it just wasn't hitting the way I wanted it to. And um, so Timbaland, I think he beefs it up a little bit, but you know, basically he was listening to it at first and his reaction was you, you try and tell me this isn't hot. Like this, this, this sounds hot already, you know? Right. But yeah, sometimes when you're in it, like I, I can relate to that now, right? Like you're in it and you have a certain idea of how you want it to sound, but it's just not meeting that expectation for whatever reason. And sometimes it's hard to put your finger on what it's missing. It's just, it's just not there yet. You just know it's not there yet intuitively, but sometimes it's not. but I will say this, I've gotten better at knowing what needs to be done because it used to be all trial and error right i would be like you know, something is off on this let me just like try to slide in all these different knobs and sliders and figuring out what works but now it's like all right i can kind of pinpoint it a little bit better i'm like I, maybe i need more highs in the vocals maybe it's too bassy let me turn these lows down maybe the mids are too high like i can kind of know now what needs to be done there's still trial and error because you, you never know exactly how much it's gonna have to change but i can kind of pinpoint that a little bit better i don't know if anyone can really just know what needs to be done exactly based on listening to it without the experimentation. Right. Like, could you imagine that? Like just listening to, listening to something and being like, I know exactly what has to happen. You know, these particular frequencies have to come down by this much and be confident enough, not even to listen to what they did. And just like, that's, that's it. I know that's it. I'm done. I, I can't imagine that ever being the case. I think that, you know, the professional studio engineers, I think they have that ability. I mean, cause you listen to so much you do day in and day out. You listen, to, of course, they're going to go in and be like, okay, this needs to be done. I can hear it. Then they yeah. go in and do it, and then they'll take a listen to That's what to I'm that. saying, but you still, and I think there's still some, I mean, and it's going to vary, obviously, but I still think there's usually some trial and error in that. I mean, you might have a very, like a very educated guess. I, I think that's like <laughs> the best it's really going to be like, yeah, like I'm pretty confident that if I raise these highs by this much, it'll be about where I want it to be, but to get that perfect sound that you have in your head, how are you going to know if, if, if this needs to go up 8.1 or 8.2? Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like, I still think that needs to okay, be tweaked. You listen. You listen. That's my point. Yeah. That you you have to listen, listen and then say, all right, that went up a little too much. Let's bring it down some. Right. Yeah. But as you do more of it, you take a lot of that guesswork out where it's not just like playing with all kinds of <laughs> buttons until you get like you, you, you have a better idea of what you're doing now. But there still is that trial and error, I think, to a certain extent. Yeah, I think there's a little a little there, but it's more of an educated yeah. guy, oh, yeah. I would say. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, that, and then someone like Timberland, you would think he would have that. But in in some of the things I, I remember listening, um, he was listening to some of the songs and he would stop. And he's like, he's like, it needs something, but I can't yeah. tell what it is. Something is right. missing. Something right. needs to be done. I can't tell. And that that would be like you'd have to listen to it over and over again right. and maybe vibe and, and you know, whatnot. Um, and the thing is also, there could be a lot of different fixes. Like it, you, you yeah, might sure. listen to it and be like, this just isn't it. Maybe I need to do this, but maybe that's one way of fixing it. There could be another way of fixing it also. And then right. maybe you want to try them both and see what works. I mean, there's all kinds of effects you can put on songs, right? And like, you know, let's, let's try, um, let's try turning the mids all up to do that telephone effect that Timberland likes to use, right? When he does his vocals, right. he does that telephone effect. That yeah, could yeah. work in certain scenarios. You know, if something isn't sounding right, maybe try that on a certain track. All right, that might be one way to do it, but maybe there's another way to do it. Maybe it can be EQ'd better to where it sounds like your regular voice. Uh, right. but it's, you know, it just wasn't working the way you had it. But maybe if you turn these highs up a little bit, it might sit over the beat better. Whatever, right? It, there could be more than one solution here. And I, I, you know, it's still art. I think that thing is it's not just Absolutely. a science. Mixing and putting these songs together is part of the art as well. And I think that's why there is going to be some experimentation there. Uh, even at a, at a high level, like I, I, I've gotten better at it. It used to just be, I don't know, like I was able to hear it and think this isn't right. Let me just try playing things until it sounds better. Now I'm much more deliberate in what I'm doing, but right. there's still that trial and error, you know, especially when we start taking it to other systems, right? Let's play in the right. car and hate our lives because it's like everything I did now, I, you know, I'm second guessing because it just sounds like trash in the car. And, you know, right. Yeah. So. Now, and, and, you know, it's, it's very personal. Like every, everyone's going to hear it a little different. Everyone's going to form a different image in their mind on, on what they think this should sound like and what yeah. it sounds the best at. And even in one of the songs, um, when Timbaland was saying that I immediately was like, from what I could listen to, I'm like, Oh no, this, this needs the, the mids and the highs are too low. It's kind of muddy. It needs to be, yeah. This end needs to be brought up. Some of these frequencies need to be elevated. Like I, that's what I was thinking. Um, so to someone else, it might have been a little bit different. And it also so. depends on what they're listening to it in, because right. I was dealing with this myself when I was trying to calibrate by listening to professional mixes of different songs in certain headphones or certain speakers. I would think, man, this doesn't sound good to me at all. Like there's no soul in this. It's so, it sounds so flat and tinny and like all there's no bass at all in the voice. And it just, you know, it sounds like it's empty, empty vocals, but that could be because of the particular speaker I was in. It didn't sound great for that speaker, but in other speakers, maybe it does sound great. And, you know, maybe if they had more of that, what I would consider soul in the vocal, that might come mm. off as, as too hot or distortion on some low end speakers. Right. Right. Now I will say this one last thing about the thing um, with Timbaland was doing is that from, from, music from the music mind, like at first you're thinking, you know, Oh yeah, that that's, Completely great. That's awesome idea. Like you pay five bucks a shot. It's only five bucks, whatever. But from the other side, I was thinking um, it goes back to this idea of never sending, never send unsolicited demos because as we know in the music industry, if they've got to handle it, they could, uh, you know, you could get ripped off. Not saying that he's trying to do that or he would, but you've got, you've got a hundred tracks. You've got your track sitting in the hands of someone in the industry that's, producing and making songs they could you know rip it off and and if you know you could not know about it or you could find out and they could say well we never received it like you know or um, or it could be in the fine print <laughs> that right, you right. Send in, he's allowed to rip off <laughs> right now now i will say here um you know in the past they would say never send unsolicited demos right because if it if it um you send it in, though this is solicited, but in the past you would say that because if they sent it in and they could say, oh, we didn't get it and they use it and there's no proof. But here you've got the credit card purchase that you did. So there is proof that you sent it in and whatnot. So I don't think he's trying to rip people off, but yeah, that was one thing that I started thinking like, hmm, 
Yeah, but it's not even if it's intentional. Oftentimes, again, right. this is art. It could be something just in your head. And there are only so many words, only so many ideas, only so many music notes, et cetera, right? So many chords. So stuff does get reused, even if it's on a subconscious level. You, you know, right. even if it's not word for word or note for note, the same thing. You could draw from that. We draw from all of our experiences, sure. whatever we see, whatever we take in, right? Whatever we yeah. hear. So some of your song could end up in, in his, yeah, because it's just now floating around his head subconsciously. Even. Right, right. So, you know. But you hit on an interesting point when it comes to the law, because when people talk about copyright, um, well, first of all, there's a lot of misconception out there. I even saw an episode of Shark Tank where they were like, did you copyright this thing? And they were like, no, we couldn't afford it. It's too much money. First of all, what? when it comes to, yeah. And, and they were like, copyright can be very expensive. I think they're conflating a few different ideas. People mix up copyrights, trademarks, and patents all the time. But when it yeah. comes to copyright, which applies to works of art, like music can be copyrighted. You don't have to pay anything to copyright it. Technically, you own the copyright to it as soon as you make it. As soon as you fix it in tangible medium, it's your copyright. Now, you can pay a fee to register the copyright. It's not a lot of money either. You pay a small fee to register with the copyright office, and that gives you additional protections. That allows you to get attorney's fees, for example, if you were to sue. It also allows for statutory damages for willful infringement. So if you were to warn someone, hey, you're infringing on my copyright, and I'm warning you of it and you keep doing it, that's willful infringement because you know what you're doing now and you're ripping me off on purpose, then you can get more money suing them over it for having it registered. But mm. not having it registered doesn't mean that you don't have the copyright. You can still right. enforce that copyright. If you can prove that you made that first and it's yours, you can still go to court and get an injunction. You can get actual damages. Like if they make money off of your work, Illegally, you can right. judgment to collect that without having registered a copyright with any copyright office just by, by proving that you made this thing first. But here's the other thing that people often overlook. It's not just that they used a piece of your work or, or ripped off your work. It's also that and this goes back to your earlier point that they were aware of it or they had access to it, but they have to, you have to prove access. So. Um, if you sent it to them, that's a great way of proving that they had access to it. You know, if you just make something at your house and you don't even put it out and then someone else comes out with the same song, you're going to have to prove that they would have had a, an opportunity to hear that song. Because, yes, you have the copyright to it, but that doesn't preclude anyone else in the world from doing the same thing you did if they didn't actually get it from you. Right. Absolutely. And that, and that was... Um, yeah, I mean, copyrights are like 35 bucks, maybe a little bit more these days. And that's but... just to register. Again, that's right. to register your copyright. That's not to copyright something. People say that all the time. Did you copyright it? Right. If you make something, you copyright it. If you write a poem, you jot a poem on a piece of paper, congratulations, you own the copyright to that poem. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and that's what, what people in the music business used to do, um, what was called the poor man's copyright. Right. And that would be take take the, the, the music or whatever it was, put it in an envelope and mail it to themselves and then don't open it because now it's stamped with the United States Postal Service uh, time stamp on it from when it was mailed. So you have a date that you can prove that it was created. Right. And that's what it is. It's proof, right? Yes. It's, it's not anything legally significant. It's not the same as registering the copyright. It's not copywriting right. the work. No, it was already copyrighted when you made it. But right. it gives you evidence that you could use if you ever were in court or if you had ever had some kind of legal proceeding looming where you can show that, hey, listen, I've got this envelope postmarked here with a date. If we open this, we're going to see what's in here. It's going to be the song and the postmark on it and the unopened envelope proves that I created the song before the state. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. So. <sighs> Yeah, we're, we're educating folks. It's always good. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about this letter, Who's Who in America and the Timberland scheme, which I don't knock, reminded me of this because this is an opportunity. I don't think it uses the word opportunity in here either. So maybe I shouldn't be so hard on them. But I got this letter from Who's Who in America saying they wanted to put me in lawyers from the state of New York in the upcoming edition of notable people. And they went to print my biography in there and everything. And there's all different types of these publications where they try to get you to basically buy merchandise or artifacts of the quote unquote honoring of you that they're doing. And that's fine. But what struck me about this is if you look here, 
I don't know if people can see that. Probably can't. It's probably out of focus because it's, it's red. There's a red sentence on the bottom and it's in bold. And it says, P.S. There is no cost or obligation of any kind to be included in who's in America. All right. So technically, I'm sure that is true. And maybe legally they can save themselves from liability if someone tries to sue them on this. But I think ethically, it's a little questionable to send someone this letter saying, we want to honor you for being so notable. And there's no cost or obligation of any kind. And then when you take the bait, essentially, they try to bombard you with sales pitches. It's, you know, it's a, it's a little disingenuous. Now, you know, people know the game that's being played, but I would respect it a lot more if they were honest and they just said, hey, listen, we want to put you in this publication. We think you're noteworthy for these reasons. And we're going to try to sell you the book and we're going to try to sell you press releases and whatever else, a nice plaque for the wall. Fine, right? Nothing wrong with that if people want to do it. I just don't like when they do things that seem like or maybe are on the borderline of trying to trick people. Right. Yeah. And some of those some of those um, publications that are the who's who, they they are, you know, paid to include be included in, in the in the list. And you got a list of people who basically pay, paid to be included in there. Uh, yeah. but yeah, as long as you're saying, as long as people know what the deal is. Yeah, you don't put in there PS and big red letters. There's no cost or obligation because they're trying to make you think that it's all free. Um, again, maybe to be in the book is free. I don't know. I mean, I think there are people who said that they ended up getting in the book but not paying anything. But then to see your name in a the book, they want you to buy a big volume for a lot of money. And then they keep, apparently, they keep trying to sell you things like plaques and press releases and other things. And you know, people have said that they were bombarded with calls and emails and sales pitches as a result of responding to this. So, right. Yeah. I don't, I don't like that kind of thing. Just be honest. I've gotten things where they were more honest. They said, you know, we want to honor you as one of the top lawyers in New York. And <laughs> this is defeat for, for the dinner that you have to come to and all the things. But they just laid it out for me. And I was like, all right, cool. If people want to do that, that's their prerogative. They're being honest about what they're offering, about the product that they're selling. Let's be honest, you know. And by the way, it's cool. It's, you know, it, if someone wants to see, even if they paid for the plaque or whatever they, they have to pay for, it's cool to get an honor like that. Sure. And some obviously are more credible than others, but just be honest. Mm, but yeah. Way, just be honest about what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. They yeah. also, they send you a video apparently of Warren Buffett talking about how great this this publication is. And he's actually, um, I was doing some research on this. I Googled it and the video came up where he's in some interview and he was saying, I was in the library and I just pulled out this big book and it happened to be who's who in America. And it was so great reading these biographies of these interesting people. And I think he might've even called one of them or got in touch with one of them. And basically they're insinuating that like, if you do this, Warren Buffett might get in touch with you and offer you one of his billions. (laughs) <laughs> well, well it's, you got to do it now <laughs> it's a risk reward right yeah you got to do it now just like you know you got to drop the five dollars on the Timbaland thing <laughs> well get that five together now the Timbaland thing is interesting because people do pay and this is a legitimate way to advertise now they pay for influencers to highlight their yeah. product right and so if Timbaland is doing the stream with thousands of people watching whether he says anything good about it or not, whether he gets in touch with you, whether you get to work with him, whether you hear from him ever again, you still got it in front of all those people. So it's like free publicity, not free publicity, but $5 publicity, very cheap publicity, right? Yeah. And then and then you get several pieces of content off of that, especially if he's vibing right. to your music. Like you, you can chop that up into various things. Like, oh, here's Timbaland vibing to my my production or to my song or, you yeah. know. He was doing the thing and and... I don't know if you do it. I think you do it too. I, I know I do it. Like when you hear a beat that's really good, like you just start mumbling stuff. Like even oh, the yeah. flow, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The flow on the beat to fig- figure out how you might right. rap on it or how you might approach it. And like he was doing that to some of the beats, and he's like, "Yeah, sometimes I just do that and don't, you know, I'm not even making words, but it's just, right. you know, to get a feel for what could be done on this song." I've so, always been more lyrically driven, and so the flow and the delivery usually 
is dictated by the bars. But I think more recently I've been, again, it's comes with just experience and just having the reps in, right? More recently, I've been probably even subconsciously writing to fit a certain flow pattern that I have in mind because I just know how it's going to come out. I kind of hear how I want it to go in my head before, mm-hmm. like as it's coming together, right? It's just, it's just with that experience of having made a lot of songs now, it just, it all kind of comes more natural. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's interesting though that you mentioned that point about him mumbling the flow. I actually heard a story, you know, the 50 cent song, AO technology. Uh, yeah which originally was AO pornography, right? And they changed it to technology. But the story that I heard about that song was that 50 Cent didn't really quite know how to approach that beat, right? Because it was a Timbaland beat. And Timbaland just went into the booth and just mumbled a flow. Mm -hmm. No words. He just mumbled a flow. And then 50 Cent wrote the verses to fit that flow that Timbaland mumbled. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So, interesting stuff. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely want to finish this mixing. I actually cleared my calendar. Can you believe it? I <laughs> was like, let me just take a month where I'm focusing primarily on finishing these mixes. Right. So, definitely look forward to doing that and dropping some new music. Get it done. Get her done. I do it because I'm a b boy. So like Ice Cube said that. Why are you still doing music? It's in your blood. You gotta do it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, a bunch of beats over here that need attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want to neglect them. Don't, don't neglect your children. So I wanted to go over our poll from last week because somebody got a little feisty on there. Oh. Um. To be fair, I phrased the poll in a way that I knew was going to elicit a certain response. Now, this was the poll from last week that we came up with during the show when we were talking about vaping and we were talking about the laws in New York City about vaping. And in particular, businesses are not allowed to sell to people under 21. And I think we used the word children last week when we came up with this question off the cuff. But when I was putting this together now for the Reddit forum, I kept the word children in there intentionally because I knew I would get responses from people saying that if you're over 18, you're not a child, right? But the law treats everyone under 21 as a child when it comes to this. Right. When it comes to vaping, whether you're four, five, 10, 18 or 20, you're not allowed to be sold to vape. It's treating you as underage for these purposes, like drinking. Right. It's a similar type of thing as drinking. Right. But, you know, I understood that that was going to raise a philosophical concern about whether people over 18 should be barred from buying a product like this. And you hear it all the time. They can go to war, right? If you can die in war, why can't you vape? Why can't you drink? People make that case all the time. Absolutely. So I kind of did that for the sake of the discussion. And let's see. Responses here, 68% yes, 32% no. So 68% are saying that we need more enforcement of laws against selling vape-related products to children under 21. Right. I think it surprises me a bit because I kind of thought that more people were going to say no. Yeah, I, I guess it would depend on who, who you're talking to. And then um, I think Reddit probably skews a little bit younger and they yes. might be the vaping crowd and thinking, <laughs> you know, what, leave my leave my stuff alone. Um, vaping crowd, they also might be a little more libertarian in their leanings. Right. Socially liberal. Right. And also, but not all New Yorkers. And this is part of the discussion that I got. They're not all in the U.S. A lot of people in Reddit are overseas as well. And a lot of people overseas can't relate to this idea. They think that the U.S. is overly paternalistic when it comes to some. I mean, even drinking, right? When you go overseas and you tell people you got to be 21 to buy a drink in the U.S., they're shocked. Right. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I think some of that, I mean, of course, relates to maybe uh, to, to 
our irresponsibility with things, our tendency to overdo things. We, we do overdo things in America, um, but also I think it has to do with uh, the uh, so-called Christian um, background of the country. Um, and yeah, I mean, we can't market cigarettes to kids, you know? Um, and so in that same vein, we probably should not be able, they should probably not, should not be able to do these flavored vapes because mm -hmm. it's obviously marketed towards younger, younger people. Um, and I so think that's should what, adults be deprived of the benefit of having flavor with their vape if that's what they want, because is a danger to kids. Well, I think we already do that in regards to cigarettes. They don't have like cigarettes, like berry flavored cigarettes. You get like regular or menthol. Like that's pretty much it. Right. But as you still, they're well, not allowed to. Was there ever, I mean, I don't know. Was there ever a, a, a berry cigarette craze? I, I, I don't know. But I think the question still remains, should that be the law? I mean, should be regular. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I'm I'm not for you know smoking, but it's is what it is. I guess people are out there doing it should people this, under twenty one. Yeah. I think under twenty one, it could be a little steep um, because of like you said, they can send them to war, but um, they can't they can't smoke like that's or drink. Mm -hmm. you know? If you're gonna go that route, then then raise the the age of people you're sending to war. Like at least make something <laughs> consistent. Well, yeah, and there were some interesting points on here that I'll get into, but it's, I don't know, it's interesting to me because this is New York City that we're talking about that did this, right? And we were talking about New York City's law in particular. Um, I don't think in New York City they were influenced by the Christian right, right? I don't think that's what it is. I, I mean, it, it's almost more of the flavor of Mike Bloomberg banning, banning the big sodas and then the, the Slurpees, right? Like, it just seems like very paternalistic. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it doesn't seem influenced by Christianity or religious principles. I think it's more, we want to protect these youngsters. Yeah. And, and, and I get that as well. Um, but yeah, then you get the questions becomes like that 18 to 21 range. Like, are they still youngsters that need to be protected? Right. When Absolutely. And great, right. exactly. And is it overly protective? should people have the right to do what they want, even if it's unhealthy? I mean, I think when it came to the big sodas, a lot of people saw that maybe more readily than they would when it came to restrictions on smoking or drinking, because I think there's still more taboo in society about those things. I think people are more ready to have conversations about the dangers of smoking and drinking. When it comes to soda, yeah, I mean, everyone pretty much acknowledges that's not healthy, but it's one of those things that, you know, there aren't commercials saying drinking soda is going to kill you. Maybe, the, maybe there should be those commercials, but society treats it a different way. Right. So people aren't saying, um, you know, if you're under 21, you shouldn't be able to buy a soda. Like, so when Bloomberg did that, I think that really opened the door to that discussion of, wait a minute, we may be going too far now in terms of being paternalistic. Yeah. Um, I think the, the difference for me with, with smoking and um, potentially with vaping is the secondhand smoke issue. Like if you want to do it uh, uh, on yourself and you're, you're slowly killing yourself inside, I think you might have the right for that. But if you smoke and everyone within a hundred yards of you is now getting poisoned because of you, I don't think you have that right to do that anymore. Um, and so that that but that's a different a little bit of a different topic because that's smoking in general. Right. Um, so to do that for for kids to say if they can participate in that or not. At 18 to 21, I think, is where the, the contention is. Because of what 18 does entail in many other instances. Right. I mean, should the government be telling us what is good for us? I mean, should that be up to the individual? And that also is probably, I guess. A separate consideration from what should the legal age be for a product, right? right? right. Because if, it's, if you're an adult, but again, it goes back to this thing. If, if you're going to treat people over 18 as adults in other respects, why not in this respect, right? Right. Yeah. So comment here. I like trying to pronounce these names. I think it's just fun. And I give these people some 
shine if they <laughs> comment on Reddit. Uh, uh, I can't some oh, some some nerd guy, some nerd guy. That's the, that's the username. So someone between the ages of 18 to 21 is not a child. So that's that discussion. And then I responded. I said, well, in New York City, businesses can't sell products to anyone under 21. And you vape related tobacco, nicotine is a whole list of them. So the city does not make that distinction in this particular area. It's treating you as if you are a child, right? Whether you're four or you're 20, you're treated the same way in this particular regard. And then they respond, I will never understand for the life of me how some of my friends could have signed up for the military to get their limbs blown off by an IED, but a beer or a vape was too dangerous to allow them to consume. An adult is an adult. And if society is going to shield them from legal substances, they should be classified as juveniles until 21. If they aren't self-aware enough to decide what to put in their bodies, should they be convicted of crimes and charged as adults? So it's a fair observation there. And I said, just to clarify that the laws we're talking about here are aimed at the businesses that sell to them. They could lose their license. They could be fined. So it's not so much punishing the kid or charging the person under 21 for buying it as much as going after the business. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to point out that, yeah, you're charging people as adults when they commit crimes, whatever those crimes are. So why not give them the benefits of being an adult, right? If they have the liabilities of being an adult, why not the benefits as well? They get adult, they're, they're about. On adult light. <laughs> that's, <laughs> right. that's the plan they're on. Yeah, they're on a debt plan. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that the person that makes a, a really good point um, in that regard. So Pascal the Wise says, you're right, meaning that we're talking about the laws aimed at businesses, not the people under 21. But some nerd guy was asking whether that should be the case. While I believe smoking and vaping is the most straightforward way to get a life ruining addiction, I agree that we can't shield people indefinitely. In an ideal world, everybody would stop smoking altogether, but it will never happen. And we have already seen the effects of prohibition. So he's going there. I want to get into this comment, though, from J.C. Bolduck. I don't know if that's how you pronounce the name, because this user was especially contrarian, I think. Now, I was trying to figure out if this was a kid or just someone very angry or troll or someone mm -hmm. whose reading comprehension wasn't up to par. I couldn't tell. I did look at this user's post history, and they do seem to have a history of commenting this way, especially when it comes to America, right? They seem to be anti-U.S., I guess. I think they're in a group called U.S. Defaultism, and I think they commented on that but then that comment isn't showing up on the thread anymore but i saw something like that on one of the comments that they made but they came in here and they tried to challenge the very premise of the question right and they said seeing as that's years after the age at which it is legal obviously no or did you forget reddit polls or worldwide we don't all share your dumb laws so but you mentioned new york right no i didn't mention new york in particular what i did in the comments but in the actual oh, okay. question I did refer to laws against selling vape related products to children under 21. So I am mentioning the fact that these laws are there and I'm asking whether you believe we need more enforcement of these laws. And so obviously right. it doesn't apply if that law is not in effect in your jurisdiction or you can comment or you can vote based on whether you believe it should be there. But right. he's saying that, or, or I don't know if it's a he, but they're saying that the premise of the question doesn't make any sense because it's not the law everywhere. And so I said, as a lawyer, right, I got to chime in here. I said, the question stipulates that the laws exist and asks whether we need more enforcement of them, since many businesses are getting away with disregarding them. But if you're of the belief that the law should not exist and or be enforced, your feedback is still wanted, right? right. That wasn't good enough for them. They had to come back and double down. And they're saying, actually, when they start with actually, I think they're already losing. But they said, actually, the question does not stipulate that such laws exist. Hmm. I suggest reviewing it and keeping in mind that in any jurisdiction where such absurd laws do not exist, you are literally asking about the enforcement of non-existent laws, which would in itself be unlawful. Perhaps <laughs> your thoughts and phrasing could use some more nuance. Oh. Oh. Now, I commented, and I think they tried to comment again. I don't know if they deleted their additional comment. Because I got a notification that they had responded, but it's not showing up on the thread. I think Reddit just sometimes does that, though. But my comment was, when you ask whether we need more enforcement of particular laws, you are by definition stipulating that such laws exist as you're asking about the enforcement of those laws you're citing. Right. Like. 
That would be like a very poll- Reddit conversation. <laughs> that would be like if the poll question was, do you believe we need more enforcement of the law against nuance with Mike Scala and Jake Harder being allowed? Yes or no? That's premised on there being a law in place. I mean, right. if there's not a law in place, the responsibility, that's not a law. What are you, right? what are you talking it's Like, In, in order right. for there to be more enforcement of this law, you have to stipulate that the law exists. Otherwise, the whole premise of the question fails, right? Right, right. So it's like, I don't, I don't know what they're getting at here by saying that the, the question is not a valid one. Yeah, there are laws against selling vape-related products. I'm not saying it's everywhere. I'm saying, right. do, you, do you believe we need more enforcement of those laws that do exist, right? Like, what is the problem? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's contrary and, um, and sounds a little bit, um, you know, in, in some of those forums, there are definitely people who are, take this adversarial position against America in general. Like, you're not the only ones that exist. Yeah. You Americans don't realize you're the, there are other countries out there. Like, yeah, I get it. And, and we partially deserve that attitude, I, I will admit. Um, but, you know, that wasn't what this question was about. Like, chill out, dude. Like, calm down. <laughs> yeah, we're asking about this particular law that we had a discussion about last week. And right, right, right. people believe we need more enforcement of that. And yeah, I mean, it's a valid response to come in here and say, where I live, we don't have a law. And I agree. Or where I live, we don't have right. a law, but we should. Or, you know, or, or, you know, I don't I don't think we need that kind of law. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to open up the discussion. But the question does stipulate that these laws exist somewhere, because I'm asking, do you believe in the enforcement of these laws that I'm talking about? Right. right. Now, I had two, two questions. When we're talking about that 18 to 21 range, um, you would think 18 to 21, that's still college age, right? That's almost graduate from college if you go straight from high school. Um, so I wonder if including 18 to 21 in these drinking and smoking bans has to do with proximity to people who are uh, minors. Because if you're 18, 19, 20, a lot of your friends are still 16, 17 because you probably were in high school together, Right. So there's at least that four eight four year gap. So I wonder if some of that has to do with proximity to people who are who are younger. Your age group, right? So I wonder if that. I wonder if that's taken, right. I wonder if that's taken into consideration. And yeah. then also, oh no, go ahead. Well, no, yeah, no, I, I think so, and I think it's just this general idea that people under twenty one are classified for lack of a better word, as children, when it comes to certain things. Drinking really is the baseline, right? As long as the drinking age is 21, I think it's easy to, to key other laws to that without too much controversy, right? right, right. If drinking was 18, if everything in the country was 18 to be an adult, and then they came out with 21 and under for vaping, I think that would raise more eyebrows. I'm like, well, that seems arbitrary. Everything else is 18. But as long as drinking is 21, I think it's easy to say, yeah, and, and vaping too. Well, see, I think, well, yeah, and and... It used to be that. It used to be 18 for everything. But as <laughs> as what America does, we overdo it. So, you know, I think that it raises... Is that what it is? Is it because we overdo it? Is that, is that the reason? I, I'm going with we overdo it. Um, <laughs> I think the reason for raising it from 18 to 21 was because it was the binge drinking issues in college. That yeah, that and was drinking and driving, right? Right. And it was addressing that because, you know... We go, we go ridiculous with it. Um, well, my understanding on that one was, and this was a constitutional issue because they wanted to raise it to 21 everywhere, but it's really up to the individual states to set those laws. And hmm. so in order to get it uniformly raised to 21, I believe Congress said, we're not going to give your state money for its highways unless you raise the drinking age to 21. And I think the rationale was this is tied to drinking and driving. So we're going to tie this federal highway funding to your drinking age. And that's how they all had to raise it to 21. Mm. Now there is a couple of, um, I think there are a couple of groups that have called for raising the drinking age to 25, but uh, I don't think they're going to get anywhere with that. Um, Probably not. Although one area where, they still, and I don't think this is by law. I think it's just a policy. But when you're trying to rent a car, you got to be 25. Right. Yes. That's still, that's still, yeah. um, or in some places, even if that's not the case, um, you, there's a, there's a certain stipulation for people under 25. 
Uh, I forget what it was. You pay more or have someone co-sign for you who is over 25? Something. There was something that you needed. And I don't remember because I haven't um, rented a car in a while. But You had um, an issue once. Do you remember? I forget what exactly the issue was, but I think I was still under 25. And we were trying to rent a car to take a trip to do a show. And I think you had an issue because you had a a, a driver's license that was outside of New York. And I was under 25. Like they didn't want to rent us a car. I don't know. That, that could be. It's, it's possible. You finally got it, but it was like we had to jump through a lot of hoops to get it. Yeah, because I think for the first couple of years when I was in New York, my um, driver's license was still Florida. Yeah. So, yeah. So, question. Another question I had about the point was that this was you. You mentioned that this was a, a law that basically covered the establishments of not being able to sell to people under twenty-one. So, the question is, and, and not being. Uh, punitive towards people under 21 but if someone is say 19 and they're outside vaping can they be busted yeah, i don't think so i mean i think it would, would be the same as smoking right i mean if, if a kid is smoking a cigarette on the street you don't write them up for underage smoking right it's just about selling it to people I, I don't know. I, I, that's that's my question it's underage smoking a thing like underage drinking is like you know, if you're under 20, if you're under 21 and you're drinking, like you can get in trouble for that. But is, does that apply to smoking? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think it relates only to the sale to products. OK, so we so, can get a ticket for being a kid smoking a cigarette on the street. So um, in that reg- in that case, can we take a could they take a, a page out of the old mixtape book and just be like, Hey, look, you know, the bag costs like 10 bucks, but the, the vape is free. Because sure they are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, you know, but that, you know, I don't want to encourage establishments <laughs> to do that because. No, of course not. Loopholes might seem attractive. Well, like technically, you know, but if it's obvious that they're doing it to circumvent the law, that they still could be in trouble. So, I mean, don't think that right. that's like some get out of jail free card, you know? All right. So. But yeah, I, I just that was a. Point I'm just, I just did a um, quick check on this. It, it, the possession of tobacco by minors apparently does vary by state. Mm-hmm. So let me go to New York here. See, in New York, there's nothing on the books <laughs> about that. But some states do apparently <laughs> have possession. I never heard of this before possession. But, it, you know, like for example, in Kentucky, if you if you're a minor and you possess it, the penalty is your t- tobacco is confiscated, right? They just take it away from you. That's if it. you purchase it, you can be fined in Kentucky, you know, as a minor. What I'm seeing here indicates, unless it changed recently, there's nothing in New York about that. They're not punishing the kids; they're going after the businesses for selling it. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, there, there's that then. Yeah. Wow. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if there were efforts to try to change that because we are seeing movement. Last week, we were looking up these laws on vaping. Right. We saw very rapidly states, including New York, were changing their laws. And they were right. trying to make it more difficult, right? They're really trying to regulate and crack down on this stuff. Right. So, yeah. So it's more with possession. So, all right. Yeah. I mean, even though when it comes to marijuana, we started seeing that movement, right? Where it became about the sale of it. And that goes back to what you just mentioned about, oh, we're not selling it to you. We're technically just giving it to you, right? Because right. if a business didn't have a license to sell, they can be in trouble for selling it. But just possessing it, you okay. can't leave it, right? Like that, that was decriminalized and, and legalized. Uh, a lot quicker than the sale was. Right, right. So every 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 business is going to do like that mixtape uh, style of selling everything, of giving it away. Yeah, yeah. Just here, we're giving you this way. The, the box that it comes in that that's what costs a hundred bucks. But uh, yeah, that that gram of whatever that is, that's that's free. I mean, and that's obviously... I don't know if the prices are right. I don't know. That's what I'm saying, right? It's obviously a sham, though, right? Like, if it's marijuana prices or if it's vaping prices. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to sell you this piece of paper for the price of 
vape. Like, no, obviously it's a sham. It would be more interesting from a legal perspective if they were actually selling it for the price of the piece of paper and, you know, or whatever the, the wrapper, whatever people use, or, or the, I don't know, whatever they use to smoke, whatever it is to smoke it with or whatever. Like if, if the price has actually made sense, right? then they can, then they can maybe plausibly say, no, it is free because it's the same price we would sell without the, the thing, but then they wouldn't be making any money by doing that. Right. Yeah. So. Or have them come in and be like, okay, you know, you can work for an hour and uh, we'll give you this free gift or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny uh, when New York made it, illegal to smoke inside public accommodations, right? Mm. There was a pool hall that I used to go to when I was younger. And they were really, really upset by this because they thought that a lot of their customers, and they're probably right, a lot of them went there to play pool, drink, and smoke, right? And so it became illegal for them to still allow their customers to smoke in there. So they tried to get around it by passing out cards to everyone who walked in saying, here's your membership card to our new private pool club or something like that. So try to say that we're no longer a public business. We're a private club. It's like our house, basically. And you're only here because we give you exclusive membership to our club. But really, it was a sham because everyone who walked in the door got this card. So it was clearly a way to try to get around the law. Right. <laughs> but, you know, people will try things like that. Absolutely. So speaking of trying things, the MTA, always up to their tricks, right? And this comes from James in the chat. Thank you for sending this article earlier. Yes, the MTA is planning now, or proposing at least, to raise the price of a single trip on the subway or a bus from 275 to 290, which would be a 5% increase. Now, the article here talks about the predictable pattern of biennial fare increases. So yes, you know, the fare does periodically go up, but the question should be asked, is now the time to do it? Um, is this a way, and we were talking about a 5% increase here. In 2021, they increased by 7% uh, tolls under bridges and tunnels. Okay. So tolls have in, on the bridges and tunnels increased by 7%. But they're talking about increasing the price of a single bus or subway trip by 5%. And um, in the article that James sent me, there is mention of the pandemic potentially playing a role in this, where the MTA may need to be looking to make up lost revenues coming out of the pandemic when people weren't taking public transit. So, you know, this is the right move to make now. Can people afford this? Should we be pushing back against it? And this, yeah, there's two things there that. I don't like this idea that people are like, okay, we got, we need to charge more now to make up for the lost revenue for the past three years. Like that's, I, I don't like that, that way of conducting business. Um, and in two, like, where do, where do they think people are going to keep getting this extra money from? Like, it's just going to fall out of the sky. Like, I, just, I don't understand that concept. Um, and politicians do it. Businesses do it. Um, and, and but I think more when it deals with um, city services or city types of things like MTA or, or whatnot, like where do they think people are going to get the extra money? Because wages right. are going up. Or right, that's the thing, right? In theory, it's supposed to, right? That, that's how the world was supposed to work, right? As prices went up, wages went up, and we, but, we know it it, but that's not what's happening. And we've been seeing that over the past generation plus right the cost of living is skyrocketing and wages are not keeping up with that and this is another example of that and yeah i mean it's gonna continue to tax people who can't afford it and in some ways this may be categorized as a regressive tax right because it hits people on the bottom more yeah and i i still struggle to to understand what the mta is doing with all of their money because there's still there's still a bunch of uh, stations that are in disrepair um, that just aren't taken care of. They're still working on hundred plus year old infrastructure. Like, what are you doing? When I first moved to New York, 
there was a billion dollar surplus in their yeah, in their um accounts and then like within a year or two they were raising fares like what are y'all doing with this money are the latest proposal they increased by either six or seven percent the tolls on the bridges and tunnels currently the rfk bronx whitestone throgs neck and Verrazano, and who carry in queen's midtown tunnels 655 with the easy pass it could increase to either 701 or 696 I think there needs to be an independent audit of their books and their spending um, to, to see, like, are they going overboard in places? Um, you know, should certain salaries be capped? Because, you know, it's basically coming at the expense of the people, of the, the, the public. Like, I don't know. So one of the ways they're trying to justify this is they're saying that they found that low income commuters are still opting for the seven day and 30 day unlimited Metro cards at a higher rate than buying the single trips. So since they're not buying the single trips, which are supposed to be discounted in comparison now, they're just saying, screw it. They're going to raise the single trips. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's the constant idea of continuing to raise. And, I, and I'm not saying that, that, you know, cost of, of doing business has an increase. I'm sure, I'm sure some of those costs have increased as well. You've got union negotiations with, you know, um, the workers, you've got suppliers for certain things that you need. Those price costs have probably gone up. Sure. I, I get that, but it's just, you know, where they're, where saying they're still suffering from reduced ridership and need to increase the fares to balance the budget. Yeah. So it's got to be something better or other things because people are just too, we just, we just talked about what over 50% of New Yorkers can't afford their, um, their monthly bills, expenses. Like, yeah, this is just going to make it even worse. James in the chat says they don't do anything with the money. There's decaying subway stations. They need to fix the trains are running on infrastructure. That's over hundred years old. If they did something with the money, it would make sense. Yeah, and that's an interesting thought, too. If we could see this money being put to good use, would we be more willing to pay more? If we could, even. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know. Um, and I've been at that point once before <laughs> when they were like, we can't afford to give you the Rockwood Beach line or whatever we wanted. I'm like, well. Tell me how much more money you need. I mean, how many more trips am I going to have to take on the subway? Because I'll swipe that card all day long if that's what it takes. Like, let me know, right? But we want to see the money being put to good uses. Right. I mean, the public is not an unlimited faucet of, of money that you can just, like, pull from at any time. Like, you got to justify what you're raising these costs for. Another thing is that transportation accommodations do operate routinely at a loss, right? So the Amtrak is notorious for this, right? I mean, they're, they're subsidized. They're highly subsidized by the government. They're not meant to be a private company, a private business that has to be profitable. It's a service, right, that we're paying for as a society. Our tax money goes to it. So it, it doesn't always have to be about keeping the books balanced. Obviously, they, they don't want to go broke. I understand that. But it's not something that we need to be thinking of always as having to run out of profit. Right. I think there's a lot of cases where, yeah. Um, and now it'd be, it'd be nice if they could stand on their own so those subsidies wouldn't have to be given out. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's got to be some way there. I, I, don't, I don't know why Amtrak runs at a, at a loss. I don't know why the MTA keeps needing more. And, and to be fair, I'm not in the business of managing yeah. the MTA or the Amtrak. So I'm sure there's some things there. I have no idea what's going on. Um, but the I think ferries the too, right? And then people who don't take the ferries and don't live by coastal communities or whatnot, they're always trying to knock the ferry and say that we need to get rid of them because they're a <laughs> loss, right? <laughs> we don't make money on them. And that money should go towards the subways. You hear that? A lot. There are certain groups who say that that you know ferries run at a loss and they're just a big waste of money. 
put that towards improving the subways. Um, obviously, people in the Rockaways in certain areas need that. It's really a lifeline, and we fought very hard for the ferry. But there is an expectation that, yeah, there's going to be a subsidy here sometime. I mean, not, not all of these things are going to run out of profit, you know, it's, but we live in a society. Sometimes you do have to take something from here to give to here just to keep, uh, to keep us running and make sure that the people are being cared for and looked after. Right. And I, you know, not everything is its own private business that where you have to uh, turn a profit on, on, on every venture. Right. Especially in, in, in a society and serve and services that, that serve the society because, you know, Let's say you did away with the train and you did away with the ferries. Well, now you've got everyone's cars on the road. Nobody's going anywhere. Gridlock is going to be ridiculous. So some things have to be, uh, you have to allow for some of these things so that you can make a society continue to function. You know, and there's also the idea that the bridges get told and that money goes to the MTA, which should then be used for, subways and buses and everything else but people always say well you know the toll on the bridge was only supposed to be to cover the cost of the bridge that's been paid for a million times over by now why is there still a toll on the bridge but they'll tell you we still need the money for the system it might not just be to pay for this bridge anymore it's paying for the entire system but i need to ask the question then okay so they're saying ridership is still down on mass transit post-pandemic Are people also not crossing the bridges? I mean, I guess it's just people staying home, right? I mean, like, is this money not coming from anywhere? Because the total bridges are are high, right? I mean, and and now with the move to congestion pricing, you know, all these things, I mean, it's not like driving is getting any cheaper. Right. I mean, and you would think, like, the bridge tolls should be... The bridge tolls should be what covers the maintenance of the bridge. But it covers more than that, right? It just goes into the MTA coffers. Right. I think that's that probably people probably have an issue with that at some point. They do, but we need to be fair. And if we're going to talk about certain accommodations running at a loss, I think we have to be open to this idea that not everything is treated as its own individual entity, right? So if the ferry is highly subsidized, we know that the ferry might not turn a profit on its own. Okay, so where is that funding coming from? Maybe it has to come from tolls collected from the bridges, right? And other areas, subway rides, bus rides, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah. So. You know, even though, and this is also a point of controversy, in some respects, the ferry is operated by the EDC, which is separate from the MTA. Right. And so that's why you don't see things, even though you should like more interconnectivity, like you should be able to transfer, get a free transfer from the ferry to the subway or a bus. That would make a lot more sense. That would make our system more interconnected and, you know, modern. Right. And so I think it's it's an easy fix, an easy way to upgrade the system that really doesn't take a whole lot of infrastructure upgrades. Right. It's more back end. But, you know, we do have kind of that barrier in place between them, which really shouldn't be much of a barrier, but because there are two different agencies, you, you, you do have that issue. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I think, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm not saying that they don't, but people's uh, position, New Yorkers positions, financial position, positions should definitely be taken into account. Before right, and that's a good point. Yeah, that you just mentioned. We had that conversation on here not long ago about how half of New Yorkers now can't meet their basic needs, and you're still right. raising the prices. And that's just basic needs. Like we're yeah, but but this is let's be real. For many people, this is a basic need, right? Yeah, and they already can't meet the cost of of living now, right? And you're saying, right. <laughs> hold my beer, right? You're saying what, what you thought your basic needs were that you can't afford now, and now you're really not going to be able to afford them. Yeah, so that's crazy. I see Lix in the chat talking about, chat talking about it. Amtrak is expensive. Wanted to book a train to Florida. It was over 1K. Wanted, she wanted to do a cross-country ride. It sounded very romantic. Mm. Over $1,000 for a train ride to Florida. See, it's, 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 it's crazy that that's the price. Um, I'm thinking of a train ride here. Uh, yeah. I don't think it would be for that. Well, I don't know for that distance. I don't think it would be that much. It wouldn't be um, technically 
technically in Japan, you could take a, tr a local train the whole length of the country, do a lot of transfers and whatnot, but you could pay for a local train ride and through transfers ride the whole way, whole length of the country. For how much? For uh, the cost of a local train ride. How much is that in Japan? Um, I, don't, I think it's, uh, I don't know, like a dollar or so, maybe $2. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Now you'd have to train. You, there'd be a lot of transfers between stations, but technically it's possible to do um, but then you talk about a train, like an Amtrak type of thing, or what over here would right. be the Shinkansen, which is like the bullet train, or they have, you know, the Kishas, which are like more of the regular trains. Um, it would be a couple hundred bucks. You know, I know when I would go a five and a half hour ride to Tokyo, probably be about like, you know, 200, mm. 250, okay. you know. So look at a Chinatown bus here between New York and DC for like 20 bucks, I think. Yeah. And we have, they have those here as well. Like not are called Chinatown buses, but um, there are the night bus they call. And there's one, I could take one from here to Tokyo. Um, and that's, I think that's about a hundred bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. I found an article here that says that in 2019, Amtrak only lost 29 million. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> But the interesting thing is that they submitted a budget estimate to Congress saying that they predicted 2020 would be a break even year. Well, obviously, that didn't happen with the pandemic. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so. They were celebrating the fact that they only lost twenty nine million dollars one year. I think that's kind of funny. And I don't you know. I'm curious why they, they lose money every year and give it tickets are so expensive, right? Yeah. Um, and like this Amtrak is nice, a nice ride. I don't know if people who've taken it. But it is um, a luxury ride. I mean, for those prices, most people are not going to be able to afford that. But even, yeah. But I think it's a, it's a good way of transportation. Um, I wish it could come down to be more affordable because it's, it's very good transportation. And in some cases, like I would take, when I would go from New York down to Virginia, uh, yeah. instead of, Instead of flying or or sometimes I take a bus, but, you know, flight, I would take the train as a good middle way um, because there's less hassle than taking a flight. Because when you take a flight, you have to go through airport security. You got to get your shoes off and do all this. Plus, yeah. you got to be there early. Now, then you gotta funny? Go. I agree with you wholeheartedly. It is kind of funny that we're saying, man, I don't have to take my shoes off. Like, I'm going to go out of my way. <laughs> But it's just, it is. It's not even, it's like putting it back on, like taking the belt off, putting it back on, getting like dressed again in the airport. It, it is a hassle. Yeah. And then you got to go to the airport and, and wait a, a yeah. ahead of time. Whereas the train, you just go to, you know, just go to Penn Station and you, you hop on and like, that's it. My ears get messed up. So I don't know if you have that issue, but when I'm in a plane, my ears get jacked up. It could be like a week afterwards. And I still can't hear. I'm still trying to flush my ears out. I hate that. Or I'll be sitting on the plane trying to chew gum or, you know, I go like that in my mouth. Or I go like, like just trying to like make them not get clogged up. It's yeah. really, really annoying and, and, and painful sometimes too, you know? Yeah. I remember you had that on our trip to LA. Oh yeah. I have that going to Florida sometimes. Where, yeah. And then I'll get to Florida and I won't be able to hear the whole time I'm there. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, no, I much prefer driving, honestly. Even if it's a long trip, get me on the road. Uh, I still want to do a cross-country drive to California one day. But, Good luck. Yeah, while we're on the topic of trains, let me do a share screen, if I can. There it is. Share screen. Because we are doing a Queenslink Rails and Trails tour. Mm. There it is. As many people know, we have been out in the community talking about the Queens link. We recently did the town hall in Ozone park with the Q and a, it was a great turnout. Well, we want to take the show on the road as they say, and we're going to be at the Richmond Hill block association on May 31st nearest tavern in Woodhaven on June 7th. That should be fun. Yes. And there'll be the next town hall at PS 90 on June 11th. So we're going to keep this momentum going bringing this discussion to the people and really opening it up to the people so that the communities have input into the plan and how it looks, right? Because 
we think whatever happens with this transit asset, the old Rockaway Beach line, it should be done with the input of the local communities. And that's plural, right? Because we're talking about 3.5 miles here that which touches multiple communities and there is room to do different things in different areas, right? So if a particular community wants a bike path or they want to look, to look a certain way, they want more open space, they want whatever it is, they can have that input and they should be able to have that input. And there certainly is the room to accommodate that, right? So I think that this project should be built with the input of all these communities and the people should have their say in it. Nothing should be built. That's just a unilateral decision between a couple of people in a room. It should be open to the public so that the people who ultimately are going to be signing off on these decisions know what the people want. And also there's a legal component to this as well, because Whenever you undertake such a project, you have to do environmental review. It's mandated by state and city law. Part of that process is going to the community and getting their input. Now, oftentimes this is kind of treated as an afterthought, unfortunately, and they just do it to check a box and say, oh yeah, we went there, but they really knew they were doing all along. Let's not do that. I mean, that opens the door to lawsuits and all kinds of things, and it's just not the way to conduct your business. So let's do this with the full cooperation and input of the people. You know, Queen's Way wants to build just a linear path. We're saying we want the train, but there's room for the path. Let's see what the people want, right? If, if we have this discussion and it's an honest, open discussion amongst the people of Queens, I think we'll be all right. Absolutely. Shout out to Nears. We had the, uh, the owner on the show. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Nears is doing, by the way, I understand a comedy night. I think it might be the last Thursday Uh-oh. of the month. But I got to check it out. I'm really Uh-oh. curious to see how that how that is. So I think it's really cool. Are, are you going to, to uh, jump on the comedy night? Hey, you never know. Uh-oh. I just might. You know? Why not? But first, I'll go check it out to see what other people are doing. <laughs> if I go there and I'm like, oh, I can do this, then maybe I'll, after a couple of beers at Nears, you know, you never know. Yeah. But I also, before we wrap up here, I wanted to shout out the Queensland team because they've been doing a phenomenal job at spreading the word about our efforts. And um, if you go to Woodhaven and Richmond Hill and Ozone Park, certain areas now close to the right of way, you're going to see businesses. Let me see if I could pull up a picture of this. You're going to see businesses with posters in the window saying, we support Queenslink. I think that's really hitting the streets. Like in the old days, the street team, right? When you're promoting your music, doing an album, you go out there and you put the flyers up everywhere, put the posters everywhere. That's what Queenslink is doing. But the businesses are putting them up uh at Queens Link's request saying we support the project, you know, that's powerful stuff. If the whole neighborhood is saying this is what we want, I think the yeah. mayor needs to see that and be responsive to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and not even just the mayor, but also um, politicians who may support other proposals, they need to take a look at what the public is asking and so rethink their positions. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how this is supposed to work. And of course, we all get frustrated that the system often doesn't work the way it's intended and the way we would hope it for, right? Fundamentally, the idea is public officials respond to public pressure, right? And there right. should be a fear that if the public really, really wants something and they drop the ball on it, they could lose their positions. They'll be voted out at the next election. We see Absolutely. people lots of power in unscrupulous ways sometimes, and things don't always work the right way. But it's also incumbent on us to not give up and to exert more pressure and to make sure that things are working as close to as intended as possible, right? Meaning, like, let's yeah. all come out and make our voices heard because, you know, if enough of us do stand up and say something, at a certain point, people have to respond to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and if they don't, then they should be voted out. That's, I mean, that's... And all right, and again, you know, as disenfranchised as we can become, and understandably so, if enough of us are determined and organized around an issue and around these causes, we can achieve that. You know, we, when we've seen that, it, it can be done. But it is on us to do that organization. Absolutely. All right, let me do. I found someone post here. Shout out to Miriam. Let me do a share screen again. 
just to show folks who are watching the video. So Miriam Besman is part of the Queensland team as well. She posted on her page there. There you see in the window. Now that's a flyer. There's actually two of them, one in Spanish and one in English. And so it does a few things, right? It signals to people that this business supports the plan, but it also educates people who might be passing by about what the plan is and how they can get involved. Absolutely. Now that sounds like a good thing. Um, again, like I said, politicians and the mayor should, should uh, pay attention to that. The MTA, all of them should pay attention to, to, to what they're seeing. And it might take even more, um, you know, residents and locations, businesses to, you know, get on board like that uh, to make that apparent. Yeah. Well, and here's a little teaser. We have more things in the works. I mean, and I said it last year when we did that big rally in Rockaway, that was just the first of it. And now you're seeing the town halls. Of course, you saw the increased news coverage that came from that, right? New York Times, New York One, all the different media outlets. Well, we're keeping this up. We're doing this Rails and Trails tour, and we've got more events planned. We also, by the way, do tabling. And I think we need to do more of that as well, where on a weekend, we'll go to a certain neighborhood and really throughout Queens, because this isn't just a Rockaway issue. It's not even just an Ozone Park to Regal Park issue. It's a Queens wide, it's a city wide issue. It's about improving our mass transit system and making it more interconnected. And so we will pop up around Queens and around the city and just have a table and our volunteers giving out information and talking about the project, you know, building that public support and really just educating the people on it so they can make an informed decision. And get involved in the process, right? I mean, if people decide, hey, listen, we just want the, the bike path or whatever, then at least that decision will have been made with the full cooperation of the public and not just a select few. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's where we are with it. Sounds dope. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. And like I said, stay tuned. There's more to come on that. So... In the meantime, maybe someone in the chat can give us a bottom line. That would be cool. Bottom line. We need a bottom line. I think I think what we've been talking about, especially in the last half of the show, is, is the bottom line would be that those that are in charge, those that are governing, that we put in those positions, need to listen to the people and take the people's uh, position into account, not just the the what they want, but their needs and what they're capable of doing. That require that means financial uh, positioning or you know what what they want for the neighborhoods or the community, and really take that into account before making these decisions uh, that that govern and and you know people have to live under. Absolutely, by the people for the people. Yeah, I think I think I heard that somewhere before. If not, <laughs> you should, you should right. probably coin that if you haven't, uh, you know. <laughs> Here's a callback, Jay. I'm going to copyright it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to copyright it. Yeah. Now, you know, it's funny. I was actually at a bar in Rockaway once, and this woman asked me what I did. And mm. at the time, I was working in the Senate, and I said, I was an attorney and she was what kind of attorney? I said, oh, government attorney. And she was like, a government attorney? What does that mean? She's like, do you work for the government or do you work for the people? And I said, well, it's supposed to be one and the same, but it's a shame that we think of them as being diametrically opposed. Right. Absolutely. And, and like you said, it's a shame. We wish that we could do something about changing that, to make sure that, that people don't feel that way. Yeah. But we keep, you know, but it's one of those things where, you know, people get discouraged and they check out from it. But the more they do that, the more that gets perpetrated. Right. So it's like we, right. we need to resist that or as, as, as tough as it is. Like we just need to say, listen, we're not going to be forcibly removed from the system. We're going to participate even more and stronger and organize even more and do whatever we need to do to overcome that resistance. We shouldn't be there. Right. But that, you know, unfortunately, I think that there's a desire for people to check out, right? And to not even do anything, to get frustrated, to throw their hands up and say, this is all rigged and it's not even worth it. Because the more people have that attitude, the more people can get away 
with doing what they want and not being held accountable for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's easy to be that cynical. It's easy to take that point of view. I mean, as we see, like things keep getting more expensive, um, taxes are going up or unjust laws and things are happening. I mean, you know, Florida is an example. It's like, what's what's going on? Like, how can we have any sort of faith in a system that keeps allowing these types of things to happen? So it's easy to do. But like you said, the more that you check out, it'd be much easier for them to to do those things or those things to happen. So. So the moral of the story is come to the Queens Rail <laughs> tour and be involved. Make your voices heard. Make your voices heard. Be yes, thank you loud. all. Nothing in the chat. I was hoping we would get a nice Lixa or James bottom line here. I think it sounds like Lixa is, uh, is thinking about her, her cross-country trip. Um, okay. that and that's, that's a good bottom line too by the way speaking of bottom lines oh we were going to ask a poll question we even get to this topic we were going to ask about the uh, healthcare proposal for undocumented immigrants which I guess we don't have time to do a whole discussion on but we can put out that poll question and maybe discuss it in detail next week yep all right shoot so and this is based by the way because people ask me where do you come up with these questions from this is based on a proposal that the governor is putting forth right as part of uh, I guess, post-budget negotiations now. But the idea is that uh, undocumented immigrants are not eligible for state health care, health insurance plans, right? Or at least they, they weren't included in the budget as some people wanted it to be. And so the question we wanted to ask was, do you believe that undocumented immigrants should be eligible for state-funded health insurance plans? We'll see where people come out on that and get into it in some more detail next week. Absolutely. So, all right. And people can find us basically everywhere, right? You were on YouTube at Nuance YouTube, Show. Instagram at in Nuance Show. And then uh, podcasts, wherever podcasts are at, wherever you get yours from, uh, we are more than likely there. Um, so subscribe, jump on it, comment you know, make your voice heard. There you go. I like that. See, it all ties together. Yes, sir. Make your voice heard. Six months from now, I'll be driving myself crazy trying to mix it. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. As always, we've got work to do. Catch you next time.